So hello everyone and welcome to our dissemination event on successful innovation in manufacturing using the Internet of Things. My name is Alexandra Brintrup. I'm a lecturer in digital manufacturing at the University of Cambridge and I'll be chairing this session. Um, before we start some housekeeping rules, uh, please stay muted unless uh, invited to speak so we don't have any background noise. By clicking on participants, you can view who is here and on that front, if you haven't already done so, do edit your name and affiliation so people can find you. Um, during the presentations, we won't be taking any questions due to time constraints, but please feel free to um, add any questions in the chat box and speakers will get back to you. Um, and then we also have a slot at the end for discussion. We'll be recording this event um, and share a link with you afterwards. Uh, and if you have any technical questions, please contact Elizabeth Hancock, whom you can find on the participants list. Okay, so welcome to IoT Manufacturing, which forms the dissemination um, event of the manufacturing stream of Pigeon. It's wonderful to see so much interest and we hope to have some very good discussions today on how IoT innovation can be used and adopted in manufacturing. So today's agenda is the following. Um, I'll first give a very brief overview of the Pitching project and then we will present a selection of mini projects and teams that have come out of Pitching so far. And then we'll do a QA. and a um, We would love to get your views on especially where we should go next and uh, we hope to close by 3.30. So uh, PITCHIN stands for Promoting Internet of Things Collaborations between higher education institutions and industry. Um, and it's a collaboration between four universities, namely Cambridge, Oxford, Newcastle and Sheffield, and the consortium is led by the Sheffield University. So uh, we started in 2018. Um, to identify barriers to adoption of IoT innovation in the UK and to find out ways to overcome those barriers. So Pitchin is funded by Research England's Connected Capabilities Fund, which supports knowledge transfer and aims to connect expertise between industry and universities and also between universities. IoT is um, very much part of the UK's productivity agenda and it underpins the UK's industrial strategy, yet adoption rates um, were slower than expected. So our project came right about when the green paper on Made Smarter was published. So stars were very much aligned for us to conduct a large scale, um, large scale um, project to demonstrate the benefits of IoT to industry with a view of creating a sustainable ecosystem of connected IoT stakeholders. We organized pitching across five horizontals covering health, energy, smart cities and manufacturing as well as um, cross-cutting theme of social sciences, which we felt was an overlooked area in IoT at the time. So on the horizontals, we look at technology, um, business models, strategy, and also engagement, which has been a big part of our work to ensure we can successfully put together a group of IoT stakeholders for the future. So as IoT is a vital enabler of Industry 4.0, um, Pitching is one of Pitching manufacturing is one of those verticals, and it specifically explores manufacturing. Um, and by manufacturing, we not only are considering the factory, um, but also supply chains, logistics that support the factory, and assets, and also innovation management. We have had to date about 18 mini projects that lasted anywhere between three months to um, two years. 12 of these were in Cambridge, and six were in Oxford and Sheffield. Um, and the vast majority of these projects were, um, were collaborative and they included multiple universities and industrial partners. We followed a um, semi-emergent approach in that we had an inclination of what topics might have been of interest, but we let the researchers and industry decide what was their priority. And in the end, our kind of post hoc analysis um, shows four main clusters emerging. These are achieving low cost and legacy integration, supply chain integration, novel applications, and new business models underpinned by skills. Um, this is a quick overview of the geography of our industrial partners within the team. We had very much um, a regional engagement focus, um, and which centered around the North Central and South and East Anglia regions. 
we had a diverse range of industries uh, from SMEs to tech startups and as well as large multinationals. And it's important to point out that when we explore IoT in manufacturing, we are not anymore only talking about manufacturing engineering as an academic discipline, um, because IoT cuts across by its very nature to innovation management, automation and control, as well as AI and data analytics and operations and supply chain management. So we engaged academics from all these different disciplines. Now a very quick overview of example projects you might see today. In the first theme, um, that emerged, uh, which was low cost, our approach has been demonstrator led. And we looked at developing solutions on the shop floor with a cap on cost, often repurposing existing legacy systems or using non-industrial generic technologies such as your Amazon Alexa or Raspberry Pi. On the supply chain side, we focused mainly on data integration and interesting applications that were enabled by doing so, such as autonomous supply chains and digital twins. And speaking of novel applications, we had a fair few, anything from quality control problems on the shop floor to speech recognition, and even during the pandemic, um, applications of manufacturing principles with IoT to hospital environments. There was a fair amount of excitement around new business models, which we looked at as well. Um, one of these, which uh, my colleague Dr. Frank Tietze will talk about, uh, was the use of blockchain technology coupled with IoT for automating IP licensing. And another one was to try and understand when product customization that is enabled by IoT is actually worth it. So, um, so we'll see a variety of those today. And when we examine which barriers we are addressing mostly, it's a diverse and rich set. Um, primarily, I'd say collaboration and the business case for IoT, because many of these projects wouldn't have been possible without Pitchin, and the collaborations have been long lasting. So we had several proposals and patents in the pipeline, as well as a startup company. So some of our key conclusions as a consortium are um, that our semi-emergent approach to mini projects was key because it gave academics and industrials freedom and time and space to really think about um, out of the box projects with small pots of funding. And um, demos and hackathons were a really great way to engage students as well as industry because it helped form connections by attacking problems together. And the um, trade shows was an interesting one. As an academic, I've never been to one, <laughs> but now I really make a point of attending at least once a year to learn from innovative companies and also ground our research in practice. So, and finally, I'd say engaging early career researchers was very helpful as they took ownership of projects and energetically attacked the problem space. So with that really quick summary of um, Pitchin, let me first say a very big thank you to our speakers who are on the line today and also to the audience for giving us your time. Um, let me now introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Professor Duncan McFarlane, who will, who will talk about the low cost aspect of pitching manufacturing. Thank you, Alexandra. So I'll go, I'll go through the big digital challenge we all have today, which is getting our systems working on the screen effectively. Uh, so hope, does that look okay? Okay, good. Right. Um, so uh, I've got I've got a, eight strict minutes to speak. So I'll, I'll get started. Yeah. So as Alexander Alexander said, this uh, set of activities we've been involved in uh, has been around how low cost technologies could be deployed within automation solutions. Uh, with particular focus on small and medium sized manufacturing enterprises that have been seen to, to be challenged significantly by the whole notion of industry four and, and, and embracing digitalization in the large. And I should just say what I'm going to cover here is, is very much focused on that asterisk down the bottom. Uh, my colleagues have actually done most of the work you are going to see here and particularly Herman uh, has has been really great in leading our activities in pitching. Uh, so the challenge that we've been looking at within actually within the research group broadly, uh, but we've you know pitching's been very good to help in helping us focus our, our demonstrator work has been around this area of digitalization 
uh, in automation and information systems, but you trying to make use of the fact that there are lots of low cost digital technologies that are not necessarily industrial that are coming on stream with being put to use. And so what we've been trying to examine is how we go about integrating low cost technologies to add or develop new solutions that enhance the existing digital capabilities of an operation. Uh, we looked at, for example, uh, cloud-based cloud control uh, in, in real-time systems and using off-the-shelf uh, technologies like machine learning and AI algorithms for process improvement. Uh, so the specific project work <clears throat> I'm just going to uh, touch on over the next few minutes has been around, as I said, building some demonstrators, because one of the things we found earlier on is that when we talk to uh, manufacturing companies, and particularly small manufacturing companies, about notions and ideas for improving the digital uh, operations, it's, it, it, the message sometimes just doesn't get through. And actually having a demonstration that you can just show people in, in the last year, it's been mainly a video, I would say, but it has been really helpful. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's, uh, um, you know, uh, automating visual inspection, uh, you, using low cost technologies for mobile computing or doing condition monitoring, these sort of demonstrators that have actually been really good at getting a message over and, and helping, uh, you know, create a, a momentum around this low cost uh, area, which bizarrely hadn't been uh, receiving much academic focus until about four or five years ago. So I'm just going to go through three, four, four or five of the, the mini activities we've done under, under the pitch-in umbrella. Uh, first two are what I call enabling developments. So they're around preparing uh, in automation environments to be more effectively used in this low cost environment. So, and uh, this fir the first development has been around uh, putting a, uh, what's called a hat, uh, so hardware at the top of, uh, of a Raspberry Pi, very low cost processor, but needed. They just integrated uh, a commercial uh, board that did um, high, high, reasonably high voltage digital communications with a, an industrial robot. The second, the second example uh, is was around gearing up uh, an environment, a production environment, to be able to communicate with uh, sensors and other information in, in the in the in the manufacturing environment with a PLC, an industrial PLC. In this case, a Beckhoff PLC. And in fact, these activities uh, were both dealt with uh, in the guise of uh, of um, mini ha of hackathons that we've been involved in. So we've been actually using. Uh, student hackathons uh, and other activities like this to actually look at some developments that we want to do with these low cost tools and technologies. So that was a, a second piece of enabling capability. Then the, the, then the, next, the next elements are three exemplar demonstrators we've, we've put together, particularly just so people can understand the capabilities you could achieve. Uh, this, this instance uh, is the case of a 3D printer. Uh, 3D printers, um, despite being glamorized as being something that could revolutionize manufacturing are really poorly outfitted in terms of integration within industrial environments. And the particular one we were looking at uh, had very reasonably poor um, sensing systems on board. So we actually retrofitted uh, with an IoT monitoring system, some additional sensing that actually allowed us to do vibration monitoring, which was actually required in order to improve the quality control of the, um, of the 3D printer, something that we couldn't achieve through the system that was just provided with the 3D printer on its own. And we actually used uh, cloud-based analytics to do, do the quality analysis and then feed that back down to, to the printer settings. Uh, a second, a se a second uh, example is a very simple development of a, a QR code-based inventory check tracking system. Uh, that we built in the lab, but we've subsequently been actually developing within a, a number of other, a number of our partner companies, uh, and one in particular is in, on a full-scale pilot at the moment. So this is about detecting parts that arise, arrive in, into a warehouse, for example, and tracking their location where they're stored. 
essentially using QR code analysis and, and a camera connected up to a Raspberry Pi system. And the, the idea is that you, uh, an item arrives, it gets scanned, and the system recommends where to store it. Uh, you can then subsequently search for those trays and, uh, for those parts or trays of parts, and and actually get the, so the system actually does analysis on the on the existing inventory to determine best storage locations to recommend. So a very simple system, and a third equally very simple system, but again something that's not prevalent in many small companies is a means of converting what, what are called job cards into digital job cards. So uh, jo a job card literally is one that describes the particular um, components required for a um, uh, particular job to be completed and, and the, captures the requirements and specifications for that job, then monitors how the job is evolving and records the different activities as they get proceed, as they proceed. Uh, so again, the, a very simple system has been developed to, uh, to support companies that would like to work on a tablet or a, a phone rather than on a piece of paper. So all these three examples I've just given you, you know, the, the components add up to less than about 100 pounds in each case. Uh, and in, increasingly what we're, what we're trying to do with them is also to come up with very quick and simple methods for de developing the solutions. So just in summary, the lessons we've learned um, uh, around, around, you know, we, we've demonstrated how SMEs can get access to lo low cost digital um, capabilities. And we've, we've done lots of uh, outreach activities around this. And I haven't mentioned this, but one of the great benefits is that it allows students to get more involved in developing manufacturing solutions earlier on. Um, we're developing a guide on how you uh, best integrate software and hardware elements and doing a lot of broadcasting at the moment. Uh, so our, our next steps are to doing you know, lots of private uh, pilots and technical support uh, in, in, through, our, through our EPSRC digital manufacturing on a shoestring project. We've got a, a particular activity running right now looking at IoT based devices in hospitals. And a lot of our, uh, our demonstrations systems, it's like the ones I just show you, and now showed you now being, we're now looking at in logistics and construction sectors to see the parallels that might be deployed there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, that was a very nice, pre very informative presentation. Um, could we take our next speaker? I believe um, Dr. Frank Tietze talking about um, IP licensing and the use of IoT within. Okay, <clears throat> let's try this. Do you see my screen? Is that all good? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for uh, this opportunity to present our research project here, but also everyone else who was involved in running the Pigeon project for supporting it, actually. Um, so we have um, been working on um, developing a prototype for what is called what we call an automated licensing payment system. So this is something different to what Duncan explained. Uh, this is not so much about the actual manufacturing world, but it is about the intellectual property that sits in electronic um, connected IoT devices. And um, uh, let's see, similar to Duncan's list there, it was also not just me who worked on this project, but a huge thanks goes here to Damiano, who worked uh, with me in particular and Julius, our collaborator from the Technical University of Munich. And then um, we've also worked uh, closely with the computer lab um, across the road, I, I would have said, if we would have been at the IFM and, um, and Felix here. Yeah. So this is, um, again, a team effort. Um, the research question we have really been looking at is um, over the past years, um, in the literature, um, there have been quite a bit of writing about um, blockchain technologies and uh, distributed ledgers will change the way how how IP is managed. Um, and at the same time, in we see increasingly complex uh, IoT electronic devices emerging that have multitude of intellectual property in it, 
be this uh, patented technologies such as Wi-Fi communication, Bluetooth, etc., but also software code that runs in these devices. Um, so we, we have been exploring this question of how distributed ledger technologies can be used to actually help with making particularly the management of licensing um, more efficient. And um, while this is emerging in the academic literature, <clears throat> what we are seeing at the moment also is that there is there's quite an ecosystem emerging, that there are various activities. Most recently, there were two announcements from IBM and Nokia that they are working to putting parts of the patent and IP world onto the blockchain. And uh, we've been exploring particularly um, the, how you manage and how you operate, um, automate uh, IP licensing um, for IP that sits in, in these electronic IoT devices. Um, particularly as that process, as it turned out, when we looked into it, um, is, is pretty much of a manual old school business process. I'll tell you a little bit more about this. So um, when we got our pitch in funding um, for 12 months, following that, we basically uh, started also to collaborate with the Technical University of Munich in Germany. We worked with a um, UK SME um, to, to um, test out our system in, in their manufacturing environment and work for them to refine our prototype, which we've developed. Um, this actually has then kind of led to starting a little company. So this is a little spin out, so to say, if you want. Um, we've continued working with the Technical University of Munich. Um, we were lucky to be one of the winners of the Cambridge Blockchain Prize last year. Um, and we've participated in uh, what is called iTeams and uh, we've been admitted to take part in this year's university's uh, tech entrepreneurship program in Pulse, which we are um, at the moment involved in. Um, so to go a little bit more into detail of, of what we are actually doing is um, licensing management. And this is not about negotiating licensing deals. It's actually when license deals have been signed, the operational life of licensing comes with quite some transaction costs and trust problems, et cetera. Uh, here's just an example. There's not much really figures out there. Um, to, so it's not so easy to put a price tag on it, but this is just and a quote and example statement here. So what, what we really have been trying and uh, still doing um, is to tackle this problem that the, there's a business process which is basically not fit for the digital economy. And we have been trying to digitize that business process through a distributed ledger approach. Um, this comes, uh, so for instance, one particular problem is that a licensor, be that a technology transfer office or a large industrial firm that licenses out a certain technology, they receive licensing payments, but they have very limited means to actually control if the, the payments they receive are correct. And there are costs associating with managing those risks, running audits. For instance, uh, we know that a company like Arm, a big licensing business, um, they run multiple audits with external auditing companies every year that cost them a substantial amount of money. But it's not just about the cost, but it's also um, about advantages that then um, derive from um, being able to automate that process. Um, so that kind of um, established trust between licensing partners. And in fact, what we saw when um, running this project, that there's actually um, an opportunity for, let's say, 21st century business model, new licensing based business models that you can't really do. So how do we do that? We basically, um, instead of the licensee uh, pulling our data off an ERP system and then calculating the payments and making the payments, we harvest data that comes directly from the devices. So the devices co collect connected electronic IoT devices, they register somehow on the network we use that information as we call it internally as the hello, I'm alive signal, which means that device has been sold, manuf manufactured and sold. Um, this is then matched with um, a digital version of a licensing contract, as well as a digital version of um, what we call the bill of IP, um, which is modeled based on a bill of material. Um, so that is it's an inventory register for the IP that sits in, in a certain electronic device. And then we can automate these payments. 
in the future, as I mentioned, um, this then uh, enables the opportunity to, to move certain payments, licensing payments out of the manufacturing process into the actual life cycle, which is advantageous for manufacturing companies and also for price competing markets. Um, it also enables um, more usage-based accurate payment models um, where possibly the end customer, those who are actually using this um, IP um, could, could be made to participant, participate, which could actually result in licenses over the life cycle um, generating a higher royalty income. Um, and also, um, uh, this, it, that is a bit like in, in, in the long run, it could really tackle the problem that um, particular smaller companies, not, not just smaller, but also larger ones, uh, often have large product variety um, and they could possibly only manufacture uh, the, the product which has all features in it. Some are disabled and can be enabled um, when the customer actually wants and uses it and then the royalty payment actually happens. So we have an, an architecture um, behind it. Um, I think I just got to speed up here a bit, which is based on a permission distributed ledger architecture. Um, and uh, we are in, um, we, we have this um, bill of IP uh, model, uh, which we have developed, which is a database architecture. And uh, we have um, developed this prototype, which is a distributed web app. And uh, we, we have a simulation app um, on the phone, which we, used to feed data into that system, which then automatically triggers this payment. So we are very much in a prototyping stage. Um, I do have a little video here, but I think in the interest of time, I skip that and just come to the end. If you want to read more about this, there are some papers already out there that describe the ideas, um, a few forthcoming papers, but also please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, I think um, this project is uh, is quite special in that it has a broad remit of applications in manufacturing. So um, just to remind um, the audience, if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to use the chat box um, to, to pose questions. And um, otherwise, we will have the discussion session in the end as well. So the next... Um, presentation is from myself. Hope you can see my screen. Elizabeth, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Thank you. Okay. Brilliant. So uh, this talk is about the supply chain theme of pitching manufacturing. Um, and we will cover a selection of three projects which involved um, researchers from uh, Cambridge as well as Oc Oxford. Um, we have, um, as the previous presenters have said, uh, this has been a collaborative effort which involved uh, multiple PIs, um, postdocs and, and PhD students from, uh, from multitude of institutions. So um, now the challenge that we were addressing so supply chains are partly designed, partly emergent constructs, right? So they form when organizations buy from and sell goods to each other, and they create cost savings and economies of scale while doing so. Um, the average supply chain length um, in the UK is five to seven tiers. And um, in high end industries, you have thousands of suppliers as organizations might be outsourcing up to 80% of their production. So one saves cost, but also one ends up with risk exposure um, because these organizations need to coordinate and plan together to make things on time. So currently data sharing has been proposed as a prevention mechanism for risk, risk exposure, um, but this is mostly done via um, ERP systems. Um, however, many industrial information systems are costly to set up, which ends up being a barrier to SMEs joining in that data sharing. Um, and SMEs form really the backbone of manufacturing in the, in the UK. They are virtually in every supply chain. So if we have ad hoc supply chain formations, there is no incentive for SMEs to buy specialized software. And many academic papers have advocated IoT data to be shared on a supply chain, on top of which one can build analytics applications. But these sorts of musings and proposals, they tended to stay in academia. 
So we looked at three very different solutions that were being proposed under this theme. Um, first of these was about the coupling of intelligent software agents, which are those autonomous bits of AI software um, um, that are the driving force behind your Alexa or Siri um, as a way of sharing data on a supply chain. And the next one was about digital twinning and the role of IoT in creating supply chain digital twins. And finally, uh, we looked at using uh, the cloud to create a custom data integration platform between different organizations. So I'll talk about these a little bit. Um, this first project was trying to address that ad hoc data sharing problem. So when a customer orders a set of goods from a wholesaler and the wholesaler orders from a supplier, which then deploys a third party logistics provider who then perhaps finds a local shipper, um, how can data exchange hands, right? So here usually what happens is that uh, purchase orders and shipment notices result in some estimated time of arrival, which then goes back all the way up the chain. But if we wanted to share um, more fine-grained sensor data along the journey, for example, for a perishable product, so that we can assure quality and traceability, um, how can this be actually supported? Doing this manually is very costly, and it doesn't incentivize companies to take this up. So could we find an automated way was our question. Um, here we worked with a local AI startup called Fetch AI to couple software agents representing each organization on the chain and gathering data from sensors. Agents then automatically send data, uh, find each other firstly through an agent search engine, and then they send data to each other um, if needed securely on the distributed ledger. So the concept could also be extended to include things like smart contracting and build applications such as smart pricing or quality certification. That project led to a bigger project partially funded by the EPSRC, where we engaged with a logistics service provider. And here we are using the same technology to enable truck sharing. So um, this increases truck utilization and reduces costs for suppliers that are sending stuff to similar locations around the same time. Um, so here an autonomous approach would be key because manual orchestration of truck sharing costs time and there's no incentives from the buyer organization to orchestrate this. Um, so this results in um, the UK, the average truck utilization being about 60%. So um, we showed that the approach actually that we have proposed in Pitchin is feasible. And we are now creating algorithms for agents, i.e. organizations in the supply chain to effectively share the gains from collaboration so that they're incentivized to participate. So the second project, which was led by Oxford, looked at the concept of supply chain digital twins um, as the simultaneous coupling of the physical world and the virtual world. Um, in the product or smart city domains, um, the digital twin is very straightforward, right? So um, there is a physical and we gather and update data on the physical using IoT. But what would a supply chain digital twin would mean? Um, and how can IoT be incorporated? So here we found that um, through literature surveys and workshops, we found that people mean different things when they talk about supply chain digital twins. Some think that it's a fancy ERP system um, or it's just a simulation. And also that there are different conceptual levels. So the product level really does couple the physical product or container or truck or a fridge location in, in, the, in the warehouse. Um, and so normal principles of digital twinning can be applied but the process level needs to come on top of that because it tries to infer the stage of production or supply chain that the physical is experiencing at any given time. And finally, we also have an ecosystem perspective that we need to consider. So how do we gather data from an extended supply chain? Those emergent parts of the supply chain that a, an organization doesn't even know that it's connected to. So can we integrate data streams almost in the form of um, digital surveillance uh, from social media, company and reports and so on to our twin of what the extended supply chain might look like. So we created a framework here, um, which we hope to bring alive uh, with a follow on project. So if you're interested, please get in touch with us. Finally, 
uh, Pitchin trialed a custom approach to data integration as well. Um, so here we had the UK Warehousing Association and their members, which included the Felix Stowe Port Authorities, Holiers, and the retailer John Lewis. So these partners, they needed to share data with each other on the international supply chain because they are transporting goods by sea and land, all the way from upstream vendors abroad to downstream retailers in the UK. So in these logistics focused supply chains, timely information sharing can facilitate dynamic decision making. For example, um, when can we send the haulier uh, into the port to avoid queuing? Um, and um, so this project developed um, IoT data integration platform using the Google Cloud service. And it was a custom um, approach which served as a single source of up-to-date information for all partners. And the benefits that um, they have been, uh, we have been uh, observing were reduced waiting times at the port, increased on-time delivery rates, and increased vehicle utilization. So in all these projects, um, we have seen that technology is there and it is becoming mature enough for really deployment. And it can lead to great benefits for all stakeholders. Um, low cost and open source technologies can be used for developing digital solutions for supply chains. But the key consideration um, is around who will pay and who will be responsible for the platforms being developed. Um, so I think that this will become a decisive factor in, um, in, in digital information sharing in, in supply chains. It will either be the dominant player um, or if the dominant player has no role, um, such as we are, what we have seen in the case of truck sharing, it will be an intermediary. But intermediaries also cost. So being a supply chain, a company doesn't see benefits until unless everybody else joins. So we need to understand for different needs, what different systems may be developed to enable uh, cost savings and data sharing. For instance, in an established supply chain, a low cost custom cloud solution could be preferable. Whereas in an ad hoc supply chain, a decentralized search engine like approach could be created. And decentralized and autonomous approaches uh, could be a key force in the future. But we think that trust in these needs to be developed. The architecture of the system uh, we find is greatly affecting the performance of the system. So going into the future, more studies need to be done to analyze scalability as well as security of these systems, which sometimes present uh, trade-offs that we need to look into. Okay, so I hope that you enjoyed a whistle stop tour of our supply chain work. Um, please do get in touch with us um, if you're interested, because we are looking very much to expand on these lessons with more projects in the future. And thank you to all our collaborators involved. Okay. Um, so again, please um, let me know if you have any questions um, on the chat and we can move on to our next speakers. Um, who is, I think, Dr. Boyang Song from the University of Sheffield talking about quality analytics. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Alexander. Let me uh, set up my presentation. So is, is that possible to see my screen? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Boyang Song. I'm a research associate for the University of Sheffield for the research team led by Professor Ash Tiwari. I'm glad today to have the opportunity to introduce our project. It's about how to develop and apply industrial IoT and the predictive maintenance for a legacy manufacturing system. A part of the work I'm presenting today is under collaboration with the University of Cambridge, Alexandra's team. Before I move to the details, thanks a lot for pitching support to make all of this happen. We are targeting two challenges here. The first is about how to digitalize the manufacturing process for a legacy system, how to capture the data for a harsh shortfall environment, and transmit this data to a space with better computing capacity. The second is about how to process the captured data with a machine learning or deep learning method in order to improve the manufacturing operation performance, such as the quality control or the equipment maintenance performance. Our work will collaborate with multiple partners. 
Our industrial partner Tensbridge is a prestige manufacturer in Sheffield Steel industry since 1815. Tensbridge has provided us a case study of a legacy manufacturing facility. Siemens also supporting us by providing the access to the latest industrial IoT and industrial age platform. For the research part, we the Sheffield team developed the industrial IoT system and deployed the system on the shop floor with the Tensor Bridge. We also work close with Cambridge team to develop related deep learning method. Our project in general can be summarized in four stages. The first stage is about understanding the manufacturing system. In our case, it is an electronic coating facility which built 20 years ago. As you can see for the photos, before our project, this manufacturing process was measured by mechanical gauges. The operator have to go to every checkpoint on the shop floor and read the gauges manually, record the measurement on the paper, then type them into Excel sheet later. In the second stage, after we figure out the priority of the checkpoint, we have tested a range of industrial IoT devices and installed them with digital sensors on the shop floor. The third stage is about development with the industrial IoT software system. We have tested the industrial IoT system developed by Siemens called Mightfield. It's designed to connect the machine for the shop floor to the cloud. We also developed and deployed the on-premises system, which developed with open source tools. As a result, we can monitor not only the condition of a target manufacturing process and machines, but also the performance of our industrial IoT hardware and software. In the last stage, we have developed a deep learning model trained with the capture data. The trained deep learning model can predict the critical process states, which is also the health indicator of the equipment. In our journey, we have studied with general IoT devices and sensors. Then we have realized the many challenges to keep them in the hash manufacturing environment. For example, Wi-Fi may not work around heavy electric machines because of the signal interference. So we cannot connect this device with wireless connection. Some sensors may not last long with the oil and the dust. General IoT devices can be difficult to connect with other industrial devices due to a different power supply and communication standards. Then, we have gradually updated the general IoT devices to the industrialized IoT devices. Also updated the sensor to more advanced industrial sensors. This is a glance about the manufacturing environment in our case study. I'm just trying to give you some insight about what kind of IoT device and sensors we have deployed on the floor. And what the price of the hardware, what kind of data we are collecting for the shop floor. It's obviously that industrial sensor and the industrial IoT devices are much more expensive than the Raspberry Pi kind of IoT device. One achievement for our project that we have published the data we collect for this project on Argo. The data set is normalized in order to avoid the explore of sensitive business information. At the same time, it's fully functional to train a machine learning or deep learning model. The dataset has two parts. One is seven years manual inspection record of key process measurement in a low sample rate, which is three times per day. The other part is same type of measurement collected by digital sensors and the industrial IoT system within a short period and relatively higher sample rate, which is the one point per second. We have provided detailed instruction of the dataset on cargo repository, and hope more researchers can use this dataset to understand better about the manufacturing process data and develop more and better methods to solve manufacturing problems. We will develop a deep learning method to predict the process condition for the following 24 hours period based on past five days information. We are targeting to solve the common data problems for manufacturing use cases. That you may have lots of low quality data which cannot provide you required details, and you don't have enough time to collect enough quantity of high quality data during the short period of the project. We have used deep transfer learning method to overcome this challenge. As you can see the figures in the middle of this slide, the red lines are the predictions 
The green lines are the actual process condition. The left and the middle columns are trained by only manual inspection dataset or the IoT dataset. The arrows are quite big. After we apply the transfer learning for both dataset, we can predict the process condition in much accurate result. In conclusion, our method may have not advanced too much in terms of deep learning algorithm development, but it has certain breakthrough to apply the deep learning method for manufacturing application. Cambridge team has also developed a demo, which is agent-based method to represent a manufacturing system involved with multiple machines. The condition of the machines varies over time. The basic autoencoder method is developed to quantify the uncertainty of condition of the machines and the quality of the product. The demo has been published on the GitHub. You can find more details there. There are lots of lessons learned for this project. The most significant challenge we have found within the project is that people from different backgrounds are speaking very different language. For example, manufacturing operators, automation control engineers, computer science researchers, they may speak totally different terminology and have a different view on the very similar thing. How to use the right language to communicate between manufacturing stakeholders and the research team is very important. The other barrier maybe is also related to this one is a barrier of domain knowledge. It's hard for pure computer science people to understand factory operation, manufacturing IT and OT infrastructure in a short time. It's the same to, to trying to let a pure manufacturing people to have a good understanding of deep learning in short time. Very few people have the cost domain understanding. So we probably should to work together with an interdisciplinary team or train a talent who can equip multiple domain knowledge. I think it's challenging to train this kind of talent in our current education system. For the next step, we are developing a desktop size demonstration platform, which introducing a complete workflow of how industrial IoT system can interact with industrial control system to collect data. And using AI method to analyze the process data in terms to support decision making of manufacturing operations. For my research, I wish to continue to investigate how to deploy machine learning or deep learning model on industrial age device. In the future, we can either decentralize the machine learning deep learning training process to enhance the cyber security of industrial system, or we can remove a part of a low frequency controller for the shop floor to a remote space. Thanks a lot for listening. Welcome to check our published data repository on Cargo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boyang, for that very interesting presentation. Um, I think many uh, in the audience might echo your thoughts around the right language as um, you know, manufacturing digitalizes, we are seeing more and more um, the need for, the, for a common language between computer science and manufacturing domains. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Florian Urmetzer from Cambridge, um, and he'll be speaking about executive education. Now, um, I just have to unmute myself and then uh, we can already go. So executive education is quite an easy word, right? It's kind of an easy way of like, kind of, you know, um, it kind of says exactly what it is. Um, it does exactly what it says on tin but um what we came from really is uh, the thought that if you want to digitally transfer your organization and you want to like kind of go this work this journey to to implement iot in your production system or in your um, in whichever system you want really um you want to build a platform for example then you can probably like kind of get a lot of people that um, will want to do it for you Right, they um, like you can hire organizations that can basically create a platform for you or create a digital system for you. Um, there's probably lots of people that offer to help you to do it, so they take you on the hand and um, and get it done with you. But what we really came from, where we where we thought uh, we could help with or um, create an, more understanding was um, how can we enable the organization to actually go this journey by itself? And like kind of there's um, executive teaching was one of the uh, one of the ways that um, we we considered to go. So what we really um, started with um, 
um, is like an, it is obviously complex to change a company to think digital, right? So there's a, there's a lot of complexity in their um, aging workforce, um, like kind of young people and um, um, aging. Um, com the communication between the younger employees and the older com um, employees is complex. Um, the organization has been built to do something which is usually not actually build new digital tools or be innovative in itself. It's there to actually stably build or uh, build something or produce um, a value to a customer. So what we actually un wanted to understand um, with this project was like kind of how can we support as a as a university in a wider sense, right? Is um, is internal capability building building through teaching actually something? which helps, right, which does something. We've done this in the past. We do like kind of the University of Cambridge specifically um, through um, an organization that is in-house. Uh, we do a lot of um, um, executive teaching and it usually helps quite a lot. But what we haven't really done was this like kind of thought about this longitudinally um, understanding of what actually happens um, afterwards to these people um, that we teach. So um, what is the curricula that we need to teach? Um, is it technology? Is it more strategy? Is it more programming? Like kind of what is it that we, that we actually need to put into this curriculum? And um, who in the organization do we need to teach in the first place, right? So they're all very valid questions and um, obviously working in an organization um, as you all do, um, you can see that they're all like kind of, um, um, they're all challenging questions as well. So, um, our aims were basically we we partnered with manufacturing companies, with healthcare companies, and with companies that were concerning themselves with smart cities in a wider sense. Um, and um, we basically like kind of um, started to to actually engage with them and say, well, actually, what is it that you need as information in the first place? And then afterwards, we uh, basically built a curriculum to actually answer what they told us they needed, and uh, that was basically around Internet of Things platforms, um, um, digital platforms, and then as well wider business ecosystems. So more the thought of like, and if I have a platform, then I, that means I connect certain companies within this platform, but there will be, for example, companies or um, uh, customers or competition or um, similar that are not actually connected to my platform. So how do I actually deal with these companies as well? So it's not just about the like kind of deploying the sensor and building a system, but it's um, as well the wider strategic thought basically. Um, and then like kind of we we basically wanted to teach as well light, um, and I'm saying light technical aspects, which basically means really, um, you know, if you if you have someone who's non-technical as a background or um, is technically as a background but doesn't really have programming. Um, um, understanding or a, a programming background, then we want to enable them to actually experience what it is like, and you know, what is it that a sensor actually does? What is, what is it, you know, to, to enable them to actually do something which is IoT related, so to say. So, um, what we've done obviously before the teaching and after the teaching, we've done uh, detailed evaluations. And this, this is normally when we do executive teaching in the first place, uh, we do that anyway. But what we as well did like after a little bit of time, we basically got in, back in touch with the people um, that we taught. And we basically did another interview or another set of interviews where we tried to actually figure out what they, what they experienced after the teaching was and um, how they saw themselves within their organization. So here's some of the results. I mean, obviously, like you know, I could uh, could speak for this uh, about this for a very long time, but um, just some of the results um, um, for you to to think about and and for your thoughts. So number one is it's not really one curricula that we can teach. So we started off with like kind of you know thinking there was like kind of the magic portion, and then like you know after we basically deploy the magic portion, but ah like kind of you know it all goes flowingly. It's not the case. So it changes over time what the organization needs, right? And I mean, if you think about it, it's logical. First of all, there's a strategic thought, right? So the strategic thought needs to be developed and then there needs to be some form of decision process as in how much is this gonna cost? Like, and if, you know, are we gonna actually get some form of return on this or is it just making the organization future ready? And then um, some form of process after that, which is an implementation stage. All these three stages as basics have different needs for understanding of the individuals involved, right? So that's number one. Then like kind of within the organization, if you think about this, right? Like kind of the logical thing when we approached organizations was they said, oh yeah, yeah, of course, we've got a super good IT department, right? So they're, they're very good in repairing our laptops or whatever it is, right? And then forward went to the email, right? So, um, 
And we were like, kind of, but wait a second, right? It's not actually who we wanted to address in the first place. It's not really what we thought, right? So it took a lot of convincing to actually say to non-IT people, like the manufacturing manager, for example, or like um, 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 non-IT professionals, so to say, within an organization, to say to them, why didn't you come along? As well, like so, so, so. For example, the finance people in the organization need to make, in the middle bit of this graph that you're seeing there, need to make a decision on saying, yeah, yeah, okay, we can actually, we can, we can understand what you want to do. We can actually support this in a financial matter, right? So we can understand, we can understand what you want to do, and we can find a financial mechanism on, uh, like, how to get tax back, or like, and whatever it is, right? To to actually like and make financial decisions on this. So this is, of course, important, right? But it's not actually logical and it's not really how we're thinking automatically. So, and then the next thing is use cases and value propositions um, and as well strategic un, un, um, aspects are actually in their nature often unclear, right? So even when you're coming to this decision and prioritize process with this second step, yeah, there is still uncertainty, right? It's never really, um, you know, if I take this hammer, bash three times on this piece of metal, I'm going to have a dent which is like kind of um, X millimeter deep or something like that. It's not like this, right? It's more complex. It's more, um, it's more liquid in a way. It's more, um, it's, it, it, as you're learning, as you're going along, you may, may actually need to change things and, and build things other, um, in, in different ways. So, what have we learned out of this in the first place, right? So like, um, let's, um, 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 let's take a step back, so to say, right? Um, so number one is actually, we found that when we're taking specifically non-IT people, but then as well, IT people who have an I, no IoT background, we actually have impact on them when we teach them, right? What does this mean, right? Like, so, um, so people used to say in the longitudinal interviews, well, I went back into my organization and I started to see all these things, which I could actually use digital processes or um, a digital platform to actually optimize, right? So the, like the second thing that happened, and I'm going to come back to the first one in a second. The second thing that um, happened was people were like, kind of, this was super useful. And I could talk to this about, like, about this with three of my colleagues, right? And they all want to come as well now. Right. So this is obviously like kind of great because, I mean, you know, it's helpful for us. There's more there's more going on in a way. But um, what we found as well is like kind of not actually every organization in itself needs exactly the same content. There's a slight discrepancy, even at the core of the understand is actually the same that the organization needs. Right. So even though that everybody kind of needs the same um, still, right? Like kind of, um, if we're thinking about platforms or IoT, like and then using sensors to do, to do, to execute business in a way, right? What uh, some of my colleagues have been talking about uh, before, um, that's a difference in like kind of what you actually focus on in a, from, a, from a teaching point of view, right? From a deep understanding point of view. But as well, um, like kind of, and I said, I'm gonna come back to this first point, when people see these opportunities, they actually start to go into their organization then as well and say, well, actually, there's interesting, look, I've, I've found this thing, right? Like, kind of, and like, look, if we use a sensor there and then do this, right, then we could actually build this and make this way more efficient. And for example, they then go to the IT department and the IT department's reply is, what, your laptop is broken? Tell me, how can I repair it? Right? The IT department is not automatically built to actually build a new system or to help with, an, uh, with, an, uh, with a problem like this. So therefore, people actually like, kind of felt very much that they were then enabled, but the organization was not enabled. And that's obviously like, and that shows as well that um, if, you're, um, if you're influencing the organization at different points and you're thinking about this strategically, you can actually have an impact on the organization overall and like kind of have an impact as well on, um, on the transfer or towards a digital um, uh, or towards digital thinking within the, within the organization. So 
Um, so we have developed this curricula, obviously. Um, so what we're doing um, next is like, and we, we're running more courses, which is um, one thing. But then we are interested as well, I kind of the this um, hourglass model that I showed earlier. We're interested as well to like kind of go through this hourglass model, and um, for that we we of course need the companies that are interested to support this as well. Um, so um, you know we um, we can't do everything for free, sadly. Um, pitch in will will be ending soon, but and um, we are looking to build this consortium um, of organizations that are interested to actually go this journey with us and um, where we co-learn to actually build this as a, um, um, from, an, from an inside point of view, but as well help these organizations for themselves internally to actually do this, um, to do this transfer um, into digital, rather than actually like in walking and doing it for them and then extracting ourselves as well with our capability. Um, I think that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And um, if there's any questions, happy to answer them um, later on. Back to Alexandra. Thank you very much, Florian. Um, I believe our next speaker is Professor John Clark, who is the lead principal investigator in the Pitching Project, and he will give a general overview. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so I'm John Clark. I'm the PI for Pitch In. Thanks to all the speakers, incidentally. I'm, I'm having a good time. I hope everyone else is too. Um, why do challenges and future prospects? So that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, in a moment. Oops. Yeah. Okay, so one of the big challenges and also opportunities, it's pretty much the same thing, if you, depending on how you look at it, is security generally. So we've had some people already talk about security being important, and it is, and it's going to get increasingly important. So if you look at just a, some aspects of device and system security, actually, uh, Industry 4.0 inherits all the old problems and quite a lot of the new ones. So you, you inherit all the problems of any computational architecture which you choose to embrace. So for example, cloud, if you use cloud, you inherit security problems from cloud and lots of other sort of things. Um, Interesting issues do arrive if you now try to do things very low cost. So I think one of the really interesting issues in security is the interaction of low cost and how much security you can provide. And this is this is not uncommon in other areas. It'll be common, it'll be an issue in, in our areas too. Securing legacy systems is going to be a major issue. Uh, very few people start with, you know, first catch your rabbit or whatever, uh, Mrs. Beaton's cookbook type thing. They, they start with the system in place quite often. And frequently we're going to be in manufacturing, are going to be faced with how do we secure a legacy system? And actually how then do you gradually transition from that system uh, going forward? But securing legacy systems is going to be important. Secure updates is, is uh, an opportunity and a challenge. It's arguably uh, quite a lot of devices, frankly, out there are not very, are not secure at all. And some have you know, absolutely no security built in or security capability. Um, but what we're gonna have to do going forward is look at secure updates updates uh, because security you need to patch in the same way that we patch our laptops to follow on from the previous speaker you need to patch your systems as well you need to be able to update and update securely because the actual update mechanisms themselves may also be a problem uh, we're in the manufacturing is in the in, in the crosshair in the spotlight if you like for advanced persistent threats uh, Stuxnet for those of you who remember it from 2009 10 11 or whatever um, attacking nuclear reprocessing facilities in Iran was a phenomenally sophisticated bit of uh, uh, kit, bit of uh, technology uh, targeting Iranian re reprocessing, materials processing facilities there. We are in the, in the, manufacturing is in the spotlight, in the crosshairs I've got it down here. Some questions do arise. Uh, because you know, a manufacturing system is not a general purpose internet oriented system, it has its own very specific characteristics. There may be opportunities actually to, which are advantageous, which enable us to, for example, craft uh, engineer, uh, engineer intrusion detection systems. Uh, just finally, that's all the cyber stuff, but you also get the physical as well. Uh, even questions like how you make IoT devices resilient to what I've described here as RF drive-by shootings. It's actually not too difficult to put together some kit with a, a variety of coils and batteries to actually cause major havoc in circuitry at low cost. It was demonstrated back in the, uh, the, the late 90s in Sweden where people managed to put uh, RF stun guns together, if you like, and, and stop Volvos and Saavs at 50 meters. That takes some doing. That was all the general stuff. Here are some particular things. The various speakers have referred to digital twins. Well, we have an interest also in digital twin security. It's hardly addressed as a, a research issue. So we're interested in the security of digital twins in manufacturing. 
digital twins are big in, in modern manufacturing and they can be a point of weakness and they have their own specific threats that need to be dealt with. We aim to build a community, Pitcher aims to build a community supported here by the EPSSC and NCSC. So if anybody is interested in this area, uh, get in touch. My email is at the end of this, uh, uh, this presentation. Regulatory issues seem to be a major. So many manufacturing processes are simply inherently dangerous. So steel processing one, you know, you don't want to get in the way of hot steel, for example. But there are actually also a variety of other uh, manufacturing processes which are just dangerous. Uh, and these are some technologies uh, associated with uh, Industry 4.0, for example, collaborative robots, where humans work with robots to best overall effect, raise significant safety and, and related issues, reliability issues, and things like this. There's a need to consider safety and security issues together for these sorts of critical systems, dangerous manufacturing systems. And as an analogue to what I actually said on intrusion detection, we have to consider forensics. We have accidents in the workplace and that's going to happen with uh, Industry 4.0 systems as well. And now the question is, is, do you have the information to reverse engineer a narrative from the information you now have available? Health and safety executives have great interest in that sort of area. But actually when you consider the possibility that a, uh, a cyber security incident attack may actually occasion a physical safety problem, then it gets much, much harder uh, to reconstruct the whole scenario from available data. And I would point out when you have complex supply chains or complex multi-party systems, getting the forensic data, just getting access to the forensic data uh, is really rather hard and that's going to be a major challenge. So remote operation and management, this is uh, close to a uh, variety of people's hearts uh, presenting today. So we, said we heard Boyang, but it's also, it's a big interest at Cambridge and it's a big interest uh, at, uh, at the AMRC and, and uh, at Sheffield as well. So remote operation and management is a big issue across the manufacturing uh, uh, field. Now we've seen a major increase in interest in remote operation and management since the pandemic for obvious reasons. In fact, it has really pump primed or speeded up uh, progress toward it very, very rapidly over the past year. People are trying to concertina their ambitions in this, in this sort of area. It may raise interesting challenges for computer science or things, for example, delivering reliable control uh, and management, bounded lat latency, depending on the sorts of systems that you're actually engaging with, also security, etc. But it's a major uh, uh, opportunity for research and innovation. More opportunities uh, or challenges, depending on, on, on whether you're a pessimist or, a, or an optimist, uh, complex systems generally, uh, this is known in, in other disciplines, but it, complex systems in industry 4.0 and in manufacturing as well. There are major integration issues and particularly with large complex systems. And of course, if you have a large complex supply chain, they're a particular problem. Uh, getting any sort of security standardization and uh, uh, competent risk management across a big supply chain is known to be a difficult issue. And it goes from say, how do you secure a, an oil pipeline? That's difficult, right down to even just, even just a collaboration where people have different competing interests. The data sharing needed uh, to do security and make good security can, uh, analysis and take actions uh, it, it assumes really that you have to be able to take uh, collegiate action and you need access to the right data. It is just difficult. The other thing I would observe that in many systems, we are seeing a convergence of IT uh, and operating technology or operational technology. I, operating technology is, is the, the, the control systems, if you like, the things that make stuff happen. IT is the stuff that goes on around the outside doing the various bits of processing, monitoring, billing and all the rest of it. These are converging and we are seeing increasing amounts of these, these just to be actually essentially becoming part of the same system. This raises distinct uh, reliability and security issues. And we've seen examples of OT, uh, the stuff that matters and hurts when it hits people, uh, actually where the attack vector has been launched initially on the IT supporting infrastructure and admin systems. There are significant, the, the leveling up or build back at better agendas, if you know precisely what those two mean, please tell me. Uh, but you know, there are these general purpose agendas which are out there and others incidentally, the Prime Minister's 10 point plan and all the rest of it. Um, there are significant opportunities for manufacturing in things like the modular manufacturing of houses. And if you consider what people want from houses, they want it low cost. We've heard about that big time already, major opportunity. They want it resilient, they want it secure, they want it integrated, etc. So I think issues of that, which are associated with Build Back Better or leveling up, just essentially, you can see much more of this and there are opportunities for manufacturing and all the usual issues come to, come to hand. And finally, uh, it's not all about the, the, the detailed control tech, and as I said, that, that, that's where my, my head is really, but the, it's not all about that. So things like visualizing or insight rendering in Industry 4.0, uh, I think insight uh, 
is, isn't always high profile, even in machine learning, when people talk about machine learning providing insight, what they often provide is, is machine learning, but the dashboards, et cetera, the, the, the rendering insight is gonna be increasing. And I think, well, we know that uh, that's gonna be important. Uh, it's important for manufacturing as well. And finally, just to follow on from the, uh, the last, uh, uh, last one presentation, the, 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 the last presentation by Florian, uh, skills development, there's further opportunities for that. There's other stuff going on uh, in you know, on pitch in, but it's a it's a major opportunity for us to in, impact on how people behave and facilitate regional engagement and regional the regional economy by providing such skills. And skills, of course, is a plank of make smarter. So uh, that's it from me. Uh, uh, that's who I am on the left, and Sarah is the pitch in uh, operations manager. And there's a bridge. If you uh, if you want to get in touch, please do. So there's a, thank you. Thanks very much for this, John. Um, I think lots of uh, lots of interesting, um, thought-provoking observations there that we need to think about as a collective. Um, so I think we are now moving on to the Q and A session. Let me just share my screen. Hopefully you can see my slides, which means I can't see the chat box anymore. Uh, just a moment. Mm. Right, sorry. I think I'm gonna have to do this without, without opening the slide set. Um, okay, so um, I think we have a few questions that were raised by the audience for our speakers, so we can go through those sequentially. Um, so David White um, has asked a question to Boyang. Um, could you give, so you gave many examples of hardware you used. What software cloud services did you use to store and analyze the data, for example, MindSphere or AWS? I'd be interested to hear how you chose software infrastructure. Okay, thanks for the question. So uh, I think to, uh, you're asking how about to, uh, Develop architecture of IoT solution for manufacturing use case. I think first uh, you you need to uh, we are considering where we are doing for research or for production. I think at this moment a majority of these two still is in uh, R and D uh, stage. I, I don't think this is a, a mature technology at this moment. So, and for manufacturer, if you want to connect your uh, production line to the internet. Uh, just to make sure you're prepared for that. Can you, can you defend uh, your production line for the outside world? So I think you gave a, a lot of exam uh, the example for the cloud technology, but uh, uh, are you ready for uh, connect your production line to the cloud? Uh, are you going to try something uh, uh, maybe on premises, I mean, on your local server? Uh, the, the other things to design the architecture uh, uh, or to launch this project, I think this kind of system, majority of the system still is bespoke system, which need a lot of time to understand the demand, understand uh, the existing thing for your manufacturing system and to design some uh, customized system. So it need a long time to design a system and launch the system. So in traditional uh, manufacturing information system work, they, they maybe spend, they have a consultant uh, spend one year to understand the customer's need and they have a design team to, uh, to design the system, then have the uh, implementation team, and also have the uh, uh, change management team to change the culture of the organization. So I think that this is a long process and uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, effort need to make and a lot of people need to get involved to make a successful uh, IoT project. Thanks. Thank you, Boyang. I think we have a couple more questions for you, actually. Yeah. So um, you mentioned about the development of a common language. Uh, so how would you explain deep learning to the operations management at the factory? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a one very challenging thing we have tried many times. And uh, since when I start explaining the, 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 how the algorithm work, the, the, the people on the show floor, may turn off. Uh, so uh, just trying to not overwhelm uh, the, the, the manufacturing people because uh, think about the, the, either it's deep learning or other tool, it's just a tool. It's a technique tool to serve a business call. 
what is the business goal is I think is operation management. Operation management is the, is the, how the manufacturing as supply chain uh, work. So uh, so I think when we talk about this technology, you'd, you'd rather to explain the detail of this technology, uh, trying to find a language for operation management. And, uh, uh, and for the people just uh, getting to uh, manufacturing system, uh, just the beginning uh, to understand manufacturing information system, maybe uh, it's, it's worth to look at some just uh, um, uh, already existing standard, like the ISA, ISA 195, which is developed for manufacturing info, uh, info system architecture. So they have uh, this kind of a standard already exist. So try to borrow some la language or a word for them. They, they are more familiar to the manufacturing people and use this kind of language to com communicate with uh, manufacturing uh, people on the show floor to communicate with manufacturing business owner. I think that will help you better to explain the, the technology which help them to get uh, uh, benefit more to, to help them to achieve the, the, the business goal. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just looking at some other questions. I think we had one for Duncan and Herman on low cost solutions. Um, so if, if any of you are on the line, can low cost solutions be deployed for other teams such as supply chains for monitoring and data sharing? Um, I think Herman's connection is not, oh, okay. is not really working, okay. but, but I can answer a little bit about that because I do work on shoestring with the guys. Um, there are um, demonstrators that, that, that would help with supply chain. For example, there's part identification and tracking um, demonstrator, uh, which would help with knowing what parts are in what part of the uh, located in what part of the warehouse and what's depleted in supplies. Um, you've also then got low cost uh, monitoring technologies for goods in transit, like temperature monitoring. And again, we've been looking at that. And I think you have, Alexandra, in some of your projects, haven't you? Um, yeah. And then we're also looking with regarding to data, we're looking at low cost technologies that demonstrate data collection and management of data as well. So there are numerous ones. So if, if, if anyone wants to get in touch with the shoestring team or with me and I can put them in touch, they can find out more. And we, uh, the logistics, there's an affiliated project to shoestring, um, digital logistics on a shoestring. So they're looking at all these different um, types of technologies. And we're also looking at how to deploy that in hospitals as well, especially with the temperature um, monitoring. Yeah, 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 I guess, um, um, John, you have raised a very good point around um, low cost technologies and sort of technology that's been developed uh, for, you know, generic purposes and how that might um, sort of present security uh, uh, challenges. So I wonder what your thoughts on that is. Uh, yes, I, I think someone else also, I think Stephen asked a, a related question, which was, uh, is it just the price you pay? And to some extent, the answer is yes. Uh, but there are things you can do. You can basically limit the authority and limit the effects that uh, things cheaper that matter in interesting places, you can just limit what they do. So, and you can also actually architect your system so that they don't actually need to be that secure. I think the important thing is to understand what their capabilities are, what the threats to them are, and then you can architect your system, hopefully appropriately, uh, to make sure that those things don't occur. So you can do things outside the device itself. So for example, if there's no chance of, to follow up on my radio frequency example, if there's no chance whatsoever of any sort of radio frequency, RF attack, uh, because it's housed inside a, a, a fairly thick walled building or whatever then it, it the, the issue doesn't arise so you need to place it in context i think that but yes but I, there is an interesting research challenge which is can you make even very cheap stuff secure even if it isn't at the moment i think that's which is is part of the the rationale for it's an opportunity for research as well as just coping with the practicalities that's a very good point in terms of the context um, as well. And continuing on the security thread, I guess, um, a question, a uh, related question, I guess, for Frank and Damiano, um, is the time lag for encrypting and decrypting uh, a problem? How fast are the transactions on the IP licensing platform that you're supporting with blockchain? Elizabeth, you need to on. Hi. 
Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so basically in our use case or in our kind of application, uh, there are two very different time scales between uh, the, let's say, blockchain layer and our actual implementation, which regards uh, royalties. Uh, so basically royalties are computed often uh, with a very high granularity. We're talking at least about months uh, or even weeks, uh, but this is a completely higher level compared to the milliseconds that takes uh, for then the actual transaction to go through. So in our action implement, our real implementation right now, we're considering two different blockchains uh, uh, system under, under the hood, let's say. So we have uh, both Hyperledger Fabric uh, and uh, Quorum. So basically a permissioned Ethereum clone. And uh, in both cases, um, the validation time, uh, uh, the average validation time, let's say, is uh, below one second. So basically transaction, even during a, a very congested times, take less than one, one second to be validated, which means that, of course, this completely supports uh, you know, royalties that need to be computed in a scale of, let's say, at least weeks. And of course, we can even uh, support a novel business model for like hourly rate computing of royalties and so on. So that I agree that this is the, that is an issue depending on the application, but for our use case, that is not. Brilliant, thank you. Um, for Florian, we have got a question on um, how do you teach a technology that's constantly evolving? <laughs> Okay, fantastic. I was just answering it in the chat, so that's why I'm laughing. Um, um, Sarah, thank you for that. Um, that's a, that is a tricky one, right? Um, as a, um, from a university lecturer point of view, I think the answer is um, teach concepts and uh, teach um, uh, don't teach the technologies themselves. But at the same time, when you teach the technologies as well, um, you can teach them in a way that they are an example for transferable knowledge, as in that um, you actually enable people to um, you know, when you teach people how to um, program Java, you can teach them how to program as well and use Java as the application mechanism or the, the mechanism to teach um, uh, to teach the, the structure of programming language as well. And I think there's uh, there's an importance there um, on um, yeah on, on on referencing or thinking about that when you develop your curriculum. I hope that that answers the question. Thank you. Um, and another question for you, Florian, from David, um, is how do we bridge the gal gap between fixing laptops and the cloud architectures needed for IoT systems built using yeah. AWS, Azure, etc.? Yeah, perfect. I've actually answered that in the chat already, oh, but um, it doesn't matter. Like, and I can still answer it. Um, like, kind of, so my, my initial response is um, separate those people who are super interested in fixing laptops um, um, and those who are actually interested in um, um, in, in innovating. Um, IT departments specifically tend to be super resourceful. Um, so if you, um, if you uh, I mean, obviously um, incentivization and, and um, enabling people to, um, to evolve in that situation or get something as well back from that situation and not just saying, well, actually you used to fix laptops for a day. Now, actually, why don't you do that in the morning, in the afternoon, we do this innovation thing, um, you know, and expecting the same output on a laptop fixing as well as on the other stuff. And that's obviously a problem, but um, generally is, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it is possible to, to, to get resources out of, um, out of everybody, really, um, like kind of who's interested in, in innovating, and not everybody is interested. There's different stages in life where you may not be interested in innovating and driving innovation. There's um, stages in, in your life where you may be super interested in actually taking on some extra work because it's challenging and you're 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 keen to do something extra. So um, I think there's a there's a question about that. Thank you, Florian. Um, John, we have loads of questions popping up for you. Um, I'm just going to go through them. Uh, what's the way forward for security systems, methods, standardization, and interoperability? That's a big question, isn't it? Uh, that, that, that's covering an awful lot. Uh, I mean, I, I think we will see standardization of various uh, IoT protocols, for example. That's happening in other areas. Uh, from a security point of view, uh, it'd be interesting to separate those things which are actually uh, domain specific from those things which are uh, general. There's already actually quite a lot out there on IoT security, and there are standardization efforts underway. Uh, I think from a manufacturing point of view, it would be interesting just to just to give some thought as to what is curiously or with emphasis applies in the manufacturing domain. Uh, my, my general feeling is you face both physical and 
uh, cyber attacks, uh, the complexity of the systems, the supply chains are going to be a big issue, full stop. Uh, and I do think that there's opportunity to, just following up from one of your earlier questions, which is related, to develop guidelines uh, to induct people into thinking about security in their systems. And I think that would be a, a major step forward. You know, if, if, I, if IoT is going to uh, take off you know, across the UK or across, across the world, et cetera, people need to think about the security of their systems up front and actually just engineering that shift. And that's the sort of thing that the NCSC do. They released uh, Smart Cities guidance last week. They released other things. They're already doing work in uh, supporting research in IoT in the home, which incidentally is going to be another big nasty area. That's a, that's an accident waiting to happen. Uh, so, and I, I would imagine. Uh, oh, the other thing to just point out is that the, uh, the British uh, BSI have uh, been working on manufacturing security risk analysis, and I actually think it's quite good, incidentally. So there is some aspects of standardization out there. Uh, I have no ability whatsoever to predict what's going to happen uh, to comms worldwide in this, in this year. It's a bit of a free-for-all, but there is there is risk management advice out there. And I think what you'll see, and we'll, some of us are working on already, is the emergence of guidance for particular aspects which are of particular relevance to uh, manufacturing. Uh, I still think there's a big issue with uh, IT and OT, which we are seeing convergence, and it's just going to be problematic. But th there is a lot of security experts, so I'll be, I'll be positive. No, absolutely. I think, you know, when you look at uh, the convergence between computer science and manufacturing, so it affects a singular organization already. And what yeah. happens when we open it up to supply chains, um, data sharing, so very interesting. Uh, streams of research that need to be done. Uh, second question, are you are security issues part of the price you pay for low cost technologies? Uh, yes. <laughs> right, so, so, I mean, it, it's, yes. Uh, uh, it may not be inevitably so, but in practice, that's that, 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 that it, it, it's partly part and parcel of doing that. It's not to say you can't engineer cheap systems, it's just that there are issues involved with those. Indeed, as there are issues involved with engineering uh, um, low resource computational pieces of equipment and requiring security because it's well known. You know, for example, the the security you can get from a very yeah, low um, low power, uh, low memory, just generally low resource chips. Uh, you limit the security you can actually do. So you need as much security as you need, but no more really. Uh, and what's the best you can do in those sorts of situations? But by and large, there are trade offs. You know, you 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 turn down the resources, and that includes money. It also includes you know. Uh, zip, if you like, uh, how many how many instructions you can, crypto instructions you can do, so, or how many gates you've got on your chip, if you want to implement el elliptic curves, quite a lot of smart cards, for example, part of embedded systems all over the place, uh, you, you can't fit elliptic curve cryptography on the chip. So there, there are always resource yeah, delivery performance issues. And, and just because the question is, how do you optimize that? And are there smart things you can do to make the best use of those resources? And, uh, and, and, and the crypto people are onto, the crypto people are, on, are onto that in particular. Right, right. And um, in terms of, I mean, I guess that leads to that next question from David. On a scale of one to 10, based on your experience with SMEs, how prepared are SMEs for cyber attacks in manufacturing? Uh, largely not at all. Uh, in, in fact, one of the interesting questions is, is how people have got away with it for so long. And that may have just been that they limited connectivity, for example. Uh, I've seen actually major, major, major commercial operations. Uh, their current IoT, if you like, is, in, is just on an internal network not connected to the outside world. So none of the cloud stuff, none of anything have gone to that. And that's how, they've got, that's how they're managing their risk. The, uh, when they are concerned, those that are concerned, and many are concerned in a general way, those that are concerned specifically uh, can be quite paranoid. Okay. The, so I don't think there's any little in the way of middle ground. So um, I, SMEs generally, and it's not just in manufacturing, it's across the board, are poorly prepared for an awful lot of stuff. Uh, the last thing we should encourage them to do instantly is to go off and invent their own. Uh, they, they really do need to, uh, yeah, they, 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 we do need security out of the box or easily accessible security, et cetera. You will see more guidelines coming downstream incidentally for manufacturing, that will just happen. Uh, and the way the NCSC has gone about things is that they give entry level, but then uh, yeah, and you, you need consultants, but you need expertise, you can't get away with it. You know, if you want, if you, if you want real insight into, your, into, into how to do something, you need expertise at the end of the day. Uh, there are guidelines which will be produced and are to some extent out there already, um, which is essentially how to get started in that sort of space. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. And um, and there was one last question, which I guess um, is, is is a general question. I'm happy to answer. Um, it's about uh, which countries are setting the pace on industrial IoT in in, in manufacturing. Um, so I guess you know if if this was a couple of years ago, I would say um, um, Europe mainly led by Germany. Um, so. Um, which is sort of the at the front uh, for within within shop floor within factory kind of digital manufacturing I would say so lots of initiatives going on especially in the automotive space there um, and um, and the US looking mainly at the design stage whereas I think the UK now is uh, is very much catching up um, if not leading the AI. Um, and data analytics stage, I think within within IoT as well as cybersecurity. So, um, so I think that so we have got just the one minute left. Um, I just wanted to put up one slide um, just as a closing remark um, and to say thank you to all our speakers and um, and the audience. Um, hope you can see this slide. So, um, so thank you so much for joining us um, and we would love to hear from you. So, uh, so we have got our events listed on the pitch in website. So just Google pitch in manufacturing um, or Sheffield, then you will, you will definitely find us and feel free to contact us um, on the different projects as well as the manufacturing team. Um, we have got a um, the Cambridge Executive course coming up um, on the 15th of June, and we also have the um, IoT conference, um, which will be on the 16th of June. So, um, so please follow us um, in, uh, in Twitter as well. And we look forward to hearing from you and looking at the next stage really of um, IoT in manufacturing in the UK. So thank you again for joining.